internet to Psychologist's Casual Review, and today we're going to be reviewing Love and Will by Rollo May, which I feel was a very, very interesting and incredibly intelligent book. Very thorough and very good, as one would expect of May. Speaking of him, this is the book, from my understanding, that put him on the radar, at least in terms of global audiences. Like, he was no longer just a writer for psychologists and psychotherapists, but he became a writer for the larger public with this book, and it's one of his best-known books. So, as the title completely spoils, we're going to be talking about love and will. So, what did I think about this book? This book is, I felt, very profound, very interesting, and very thorough, as I've stated before. So, let's begin with the love side of sins. Love in our day and age is complicated, at least according to Rollo May. And when I say day and age, this book was published in the late 60s. So I feel that on certain sins it has aged a bit, but the global message stays the same, especially in our digital age where contact, reciprocity, friendships, love, all of these sins go through the digital, which is also very detached maybe even more so than in May's era. But what he states, and what I found very interesting, very true still to this day, is that basically we are very, very detached. We have separated sexuality as a whole and love. That even though we might sometimes, they might sometimes cross, they're not always crossed, and sometimes they even split right down the middle, meaning there's no contact between both. And for him, that's a state of alienation, and that's what he explains in the book. Basically, the inability to bond the both of them is what's problematic. Now, this doesn't mean that they have to always go together, but for him, they have to be able to be paired together, and that's very, very important. And he felt that in the late 60s, early 70s, people were not able to do it, or not as thoroughly as they used to in the previous ages. And I think, as I stated, that basically... It's right in line with where we, we are now today. Perhaps there's more of a narcissistic approach to these perspectives in nowadays, but that's a whole other topic, and I'm not going to open it today. But the interesting scene with May is that basically he talks about how that separation come from the fact that basically people started started saying to fuck rather than to have sex, and that sin started slowly being more and more open-minded, but in that open-mindedness it became a dogma, meaning that you have to be able to have sex without love. And for him that's a big mistake, that you shouldn't be separating both of them, that both of them have to be pair-bonded, as I've stated earlier. So, basically, he's also into the fact that basically love is also a means for creation, that creation is all is in of itself something that can be artistic, it can be rational. There's a whole range of areas where love can help create. And he calls that power to create, that power to be uh, daimonic. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. It comes from Socrates, which felt that his passions were incarnate within a, a voice. I don't think it's a voice like in schizophrenia, but a voice that pushed him to do sins, in a way like the like the drives of Freud, and he does draw that parallel. May, May does draw the parallel between the daimonic love and the urges or the drives for Freud, and basically it's a point that I felt was completely fair, as basically the daimonic source of ourselves pushes us to desire, to love, to care. And that's something that's going to be very important later on with Will, but that urge, in a way, has to be confronted. It can't be left to die, and it cannot be left repressed. Because as he, say, as he states, if you repress it, then basically it just festers, a bit like a wound, and it just becomes a burden on your life. You're not living your life anymore if you're not accepting the daimonic within yourself. You just basically repressing it and living a pseudo-life. And he does think that basically our whole society, humanity as a whole, does not accept the daimonic. And in that inacceptance of the daimonic, we project our fears, our hatred, our love, our humanity onto something else. And the bad sides of humanity, might I add, not necessarily the good sides, as we keep them for us. So for him, 
except in the daimonic, is paramount in one's life. And I do agree, maybe less emphatically, but I do agree that we have to accept the bad sides of our personalities, as this is a mature way of seeing the world, is integrating the good and the bad at the same time. If you're interested in that, um, Otto Kernberg has a whole transfer-focus-based therapy, which is basically that, like integrating both good and bad at the same time with the same people. Very interesting, but and yet again, I'm, I'm not going to dive too deep into this, as we're going to stay on love and will. So basically, love is both power, it's compassion, it's a source of basically everything that we can be or should be. And so for him, basically, this love has to be binded with will. So for me, will is a very interestingly separated or subdivide. For him, there is the wish. The wish is basically the fact that you might want something. It's a possibility within your mind. Like, for example, I don't know. Let's say I want an ice cream. Even though it's freezing in Paris, I want an ice cream. That's the wish. Now... The will only comes in with something else. He says that the will can only occur, the wish can only transform into the will, if you may, if into the action, with the hope of intent. So what is intent? For me, intent is basically meaning. That meaning is what's going to be able to push one to go for the will, to have the will to do something. Without the meaning, the will just isn't there, and therefore it stays a wish. Like, for example, in my case, let's say, if I wish an ice cream, if I put meaning into that ice cream, it's a stupid example, but it's for you to understand, the meaning, let's say, of I want that ice cream because I love the flavor of it, that's a meaning. I want to enjoy a moment in my day, have it as a reward, so on and so forth. That meaning is going to push me to, to act it out in the, in the will. And it does state that basically for people who haven't been able to be loved properly, that haven't been able to be given everything that they needed as infants or even as adults, well, they're going to replace will with love in a way, and they're going to just act, start acting out as a way of acquiring things that they they want and to have the love of others but that's always a losing strategy and he does point that out which is something that I found very very interesting and the other thing with will is that it that will is condensed with meaning but for me the top of the meaning that one can have is caring for others caring for the world caring for everything and it does go for the Heideggerian position of care However, I think that he does adapt it a bit because Heidegger is more about like attention to something. I think I'm not a Heidegger expert, so feel free to, to tell me if I'm wrong. But it's the fact of paying attention that may pushes it a step further. It's not just the fact of paying attention. It's the fact of having something you care about, having something that you're willing to do. So having something that just needs to be done for someone else because that allows you to bind both love and will, things that have in his day and age, and I think it's still the case nowadays, still been a big problem. Because basically, for me, in, the, in terms of will, one has gone from a rigid Victorian era where if you want it, you can do it, to a more apathetic age. And I feel that right now we're kind of in between that will is incredibly important and something that's pushed over and over and again in discourse, but it's also pushed back by mental illness and the discourse on mental illness, that it's not a choice. So I think that basically May has pointed out things that are still very relevant to, the, to today's world, which is interesting, and shows that we haven't changed that much. And on the question of change, he does say that even the, in ancient Greece, people could be anxious about change be anxious about their will or their love. So it's nothing new or brand new, but it's something that he thinks is more cyclical, that it comes back in moments of great change or great destabilization, both for the individual and for the society, for the collective. And that was incredibly interesting. And I feel that basically this book is a must read if you're interested in the idea of love and in the idea of will. 
and it holds up incredibly well and is quite an easy read as, his, as he always explains what he's on about. He always gives the examples and he never tries to, to show jargon or to show how much he knows, even though you can completely feel it. And he's going to go through mythology, through theatre, through a whole range of examples to make his points, which is a, a wonderful read. So I would recommend it. And if you like the video or you want to ask something, please feel free to do so. Anyway, see you in the next one. Bye.